you know, I, I'm a I'm a real friend and lover person. I like how how thick or thin that edge can be between the two, how one can hinge from one to the other and back. I um, really am interested also in how primary partnerships and romantic partnerships look like best friendships. I love yeah. I love this film. Uh, congratulations on Thank it. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the word beautiful. I think it's beautiful too. That was my feeling last night. Yeah. So for, for I, I texted you last night and I said it is a beautiful film. I didn't know when I woke up this morning. I was like, oh, should I have said it was rip roaring and hilarious nope. and, and everything? What you said was perfect. It really Thank is you. because um, I, I want to talk a little bit about that beauty. But first, I want to talk about where the film came from. So my understanding is you, you wrote this film while you were pregnant. Yeah. You and and, and Josh, and I believe he was expecting him, him and his yes. partner were expecting a child That's as well. Right. And you started to make a list of the absurd things that you were noticing mm -hmm. while you were pregnant. Yeah. Tell me about that and tell me some of the things that were on that list. And also, um, Susie Fox, our producer, and me and Josh's manager had a one and a three-year-old. So she was really occupying this role that Michelle Buteau plays as Dawn with two kids and married. And Josh and I were naive to how much sleep you actually lose having a kid. And um, some things on that list were um, horniness. I just have never heard I, i've heard the journey of motherhood and parenthood at large but uh, motherhood being so sexless and desexualized and when i was pregnant I, I couldn't believe the spontaneous arousal it was so animalistic it was it was funny you know it was really it was really <laughs> surprising and funny um amniocentesis which is a, a key comedic scene in our in our movie the big needle nuts crazy <laughs> crazy and I, I i keep saying this but i have to say it again it's like a huge long skinny ass needle that goes in the belly it seems like a cartoon procedure it seems like maybe if you're doing this on a farm animal acceptable on a human it's just it's just it seems barbaric and Josh's wife and myself and Susie, none of us had amniocentesis. But all you got to do to write a good scene ar around that is just know what it is at all. Yeah. And it's, you know, the placenta, delivering the placenta that if you have one child you actually and, and you birth it vaginally, you actually birth twice. Yeah. My placenta was as heavy as my baby. Yeah. Crazy. There's just a brief little moment in the film where... Yeah, Michelle's character says to you, yeah, they don't tell you about this part. Yeah. And like, you know, uh, I, I've heard this about Broad City, too, that like my work educates and I'm like, you know, that's pretty sad. <laughs> that's pretty pathetic. Well, let, let's talk about how sad and pathetic <laughs> that, <laughs> that it is. Yeah. Well, but, but, but first, let's let's mm -hmm. let, let, let's follow this line. So yeah. you're, 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 you're pregnant, you're writing this film, you're yeah. noticing all these sort of horniness and which is a word I've never said on the CPC. Cool. Uh, educating. Um, horniness, amniocentesis, a lot of different things. And you're thinking, okay, this is an opportunity to, t to tell the story of pregnancy maybe that doesn't often get told. Well, we were like, this is funny. We were surprised. It was funny. It was so funny and uncovered this material, this story from this perspective so shamefully uncovered. And, um, and then, you know, among these like, very funny points the the thread that kept pulling us in and making us lean in as you know future viewers of our own movie the thing that made us be like huh that's that's juicy that's chewy is the is the loss at this time the the we all you know you expect the gain and you're going to gain a baby and it's going to be wild and interesting and hard but the loss of your identity, your time, your space, your bodily autonomy, and your friendships. There's, um, you know, unsee uh, you can't unsee the loss that you experience in these years. And it's been, it's sad, you know, it, it is sad. And it is, um, there's something to grieve too uh, when you gain the miracle of a child. And um, actually, uh, the character of Claude is based on me and uh, Josh Rabinowitz's mutual best friend, the beloved late great Kevin Barnett, who was um, a a such a funny but heartfelt stand-up writer, producer, 
actor and um and musician he was like really um a talented artist from a young age his creativity fostered by his awesome parents and we lost him in 2019 and that's who uh the character of claude is based on and i think you know recently i was asked in an interview the difference of covering friendship during broad city and in babes and i arose at the answer during the interview which was that you know i'm more um able to hold loss and, and so is Josh, certainly. This was like the biggest loss of our lives that we had experienced. You're more able to hold loss given that you lost a friend. Yes. And and that I'm older, you know? Like yeah. you just start to lose things as you as and people um, as you get older. You, you start to lose friendships as you get right. older. Right, exactly. Know? And friendships start to change. And right. friendships that you think you're going to have your entire life when you're in your 20s to start changing. And no one, it's not like someone gets canceled or someone, you know, uh, does something bad or they tell you off. It just things start to drift apart. And in some ways, that's what I thought the film was was, was about as much as it was about pregnancy. That's it, right. It's about friendship. Right. It's about you and, and, and Michelle's character. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about that. What's interesting to you about the loss of friendship as uh, as you become a new parent, as you get older? <sighs> oh, man. Is that That's... something that was in your life? Is that something you noticed? Is that? Yeah. Like my, you know, I, I live in um, New York City and I grew up on Long Island. So I have a lot of my oldest friends around and I was not the first to have a baby. I experienced that shift, that loss of the prior friendship and also the the like trying to contain and hold the shape of what it had been and like the container just becomes different and um and broad city like you know abby and i were were privileged enough to choose to end broad city uh we were contracted for more seasons it was like a tough a tough break for comedy central but um we knew that creatively and personally we needed to end it but that loss was so painful and took years to understand and process in a way that doesn't feel, you know, that doesn't feel bad, but feels sweet and tender at this point. So you, when you were making this film, you were thinking, I want to talk a little bit about this. I want to talk a little bit about this loss of friendship. You know, like I I think the story arose and then really the, the press period, I, I find the press period the most challenging between writing and- This period right now? Yes. Right. Like in the phase of art that I'm privileged to make and then have seen by the world, writing, performing and, and filming and editing, I find press to be so far the most challenging Why? for me. Sorry. Sorry? No, it's, it's not you. <laughs> I'm Canadian. Um, I'm I think Canadian. it's, I yeah, yeah, it. yeah. You're yeah. like, sorry all day. Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, I, you're right. I just took it as me, by the way. Yeah, the it's entire, not you. The it's entire... not you. It, but it's it's because it's a type of performance that I didn't like realize and didn't realize I could prepare for. And now yeah. being a mom and being 37 and realizing and having the experience of the past few years of having to ask for help and then taking pride in asking for help. The, in this press period, it's like the first time I got a little more help in gathering my thoughts and preparing them. And it's it's not um, – I used to think it was like, well, if I offer a genuine piece of myself, a spiritual limb, then I'll – you know, it's like uh, – I, I feel like I've sounded like the president of an after-school club. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like some of your answers over the years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, I mean, it's like, I don't know what it is. But like, you know, and I, I've I've had shame about that where I'm like, what am I talking about? And I certainly don't don't watch watch it. But um, now I'm seeing it as this this privilege to have the space. Anybody cares to hear how this project came together? It's like, it's such a privilege. I've been having the most fun with it than I have yeah, than yeah. I ever have. Yeah. And it's like the the chance to actually reflect on what we actually were trying to say. I think the loss piece has arose and has arose the latest, like in press where I'm like, damn, that's it's, what I was reflecting on. And Kevin, you know, Josh and I thought we were basing a character on Kevin, but actually this theme yeah. of the whole movie is based on Kevin. What we set out to do, like the only thing that was outside in about this movie for me, Josh and Susie Fox, yeah. was to make a an outrageous comedy, a really funny comedy that had a lot of heart. Right. Big comedy, big heart. That, that outrageousness is, is interesting to me because, um, as you mentioned, there's the uh, um, uh, uh, amniocentesis. There's the, um, the, the horniness, as we talked about. Um, I heard that when you send out the script to people, there was like a, a – you got a reaction of like gross. Yes. And at first like – from who? From studios? From 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 um. You don't have to tell me, but you know, like reps, like yeah. 
agents, managers um, trying to start to, and production companies yeah. starting to see like, can we get this made? Do we attach a person who's really famous and a box office guarantee to get this made? How do we get this made? And um, at first I was like, well, that's misogyny. You know, women talk about their true authentic experience and it's seen as gross, but we're just not used to it. And women are pigeonholed across all socioeconomic statuses, you know, in different ways, in different ethnic and racial pockets of the world. We're just pigeonholed to be this one thing. And 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 I'm gross. This is my life. You know what I mean? But now I'm like, I'm taking it less. I mean, certainly because I've got the movie made and it's the movie that we wanted and I love it so much. Um huge privileged position to be in with that space i i'm reflecting like it's not for everybody and that's fine and a lot of that is cultural conditioning but what am i going to undo your whole life you know what i mean like that you've been living in the world we all lived in the same world grown up in the same world and then different worlds to a degree but you know some people you know have taken the conditioning in one way i've resisted it to stay true to myself and listen to uh, different perspectives and embody the perspective that I do. And it's not personal and it's not even insulting. It's not personal. It reflects that person's experience in the world, which is likely one of not listening to a woman's authentic experience and laughing with them about it. You, I mean, but that, that, that's what it makes me think about is that um, – it is a reflection of – it sounds to me like a reflection of like society's discomfort with, as you mentioned, the truth of, of folks who can who can have kids, uh, the authentic gross parts of, of having a kid, which aren't, which aren't that gross. And um, I, I, I was reading an interview with you the other day and it, you brought up a really interesting point that like – a lot of mainstream pregnancy films are actually told from the perspective of men. Like yeah. you think about Knocked Up, you think about Three Men and a Baby. Like, yeah, I, I was sort of shocked by that. Yeah, I mean, that's when we, when Susie and Josh and I put together this list, and we're thinking, has this been covered? Has this been covered? None of it has been covered because it's all about men. It, it's and there's sort of like an implied joke there that it's like, and it's about the guy. He's not fit to be a dad, yeah, you right. know. And it's like, okay, <laughs> great, um, okay. And and to be honest, I find that dehumanizing to men. You know, I want to like I I I want to see a movie about a guy who's like a better dad than he expected, and he loves it. But then something else is broken about him that he didn't realize was broken until faced with. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm just like I I I think you know we we. I'm so proud of the complex male characters in this movie, of which there are many. The Lucas Brothers, Hassan Minhaj, Oliver Platt, John Carroll Lynch. Um, I'm so proud to show men who are um, hilarious, beautiful, vulnerable, hideous um, at times and annoyed and pissed off and frustrated. And I actually think so many stories centering men dehumanize men and right. make them binary and you know, uh, yeah, and serve this sort of societal purpose to keep things neat and clean, and you're either a zero or a one. What did you need to make sure you got right in making this film? Well, af off of coming off of that, I think Hassan Minhaj's character was really important to us. To we get right. To get right. We did not want this husband who's like this, like, Oh, can you set up who he is in the film? So um, Hassan plays Don, played by Michelle Buteau's husband, Marty. And they have a five-year-old and they have a new baby. And it's hard on everybody in the house. They're both working parents and they're aspirational. They they buy a house that's a little bit out of their price range. They have a mortgage. You When you buy a house, stuff comes up that you have to pay for and you didn't realize. And they're under a lot of pressure. And we really didn't want – we had – we wanted this this guy who's an awesome husband, loving, you know, just some uh, someone that the audience would want to be their husband. But we didn't want him to be two dimensional and um, just a nice guy who will do whatever a woman needs. You know, he's he's annoyed and frustrated and and you know um, tangled up inside too. Sort of the bigger themes of what to get right. You know what we had to get right? Um, I think the the trade-off between the gain and the loss, the balance between the joy and the suffering in these characters' position. Um, because we were reflecting so much on our dear, phenomenal friend, 
Kevin's death, we had gone in this like sadder, dramatic direction and a soul searching direction at some point. And um, we were like, we, we really wanted this to be funny. We wanted this to be a comedy that you have to see in theaters or, or you, you like remember seeing in theaters and laughing at with your community. And um, it was that balance, comedy and heart. We just, we went lopsided in, in both directions. And then I think we found the balance, uh, just struck the right chord in the final edit. I love the mushroom scene. I'm glad. I have a question about it. Please. I watched this um, um, interview with uh, ooh, Bruce Dern. And he said something like, um, you know, the thing about, uh, I think, and I actually think this has like become like a bit of an acting cliche that I just don't know about because mm. I'm not in the acting world. So uh, forgive me if this is like a well-trod acting cliche. Forgive me. That um, if you're acting drunk, if you want to seem like a drunk guy, the trick is to not act drunk. The trick is to like try to hide it a little mm, bit, mm, to try mm. to hide it a little bit, you know, so you, you seem like you're trying to not show off, you know, people who go like, oh my God, I'm so uh-huh, hammered. That's uh-huh. not really an accurate portrayal of acting drunk. Uh-huh. This is one of the first um, I'm on mushrooms scenes I've ever seen in a in a mainstream film. Mm. What's the trick to acting like you're on mushrooms? I think that's a very good call about, uh, and Bruce Dern should know. Um, yeah, he's so all right. He's been in the business for he's a while. Pretty good. It's true. It's like, I think um, you don't want your face melting off. And there's also this old, this old like adage of Mike Nichols uh, directing, I forget what movie it was, but that he directed um, this actress. She was about to get bad news. So pick up the phone really upbeat. Um, and actually shout out to Jermaine Fowler in Judas and the Black Messiah before um, – the carnage occurs. He answers the door really upbeat. And You're right. They, they they don't know they're about to get bad news. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 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 It, yeah. It sort of helps the audience take those twists and turns. Yeah. Um. So I think it was like more um uh riding the loopiness of how tired we were rather than trying to act um like we're tripping. And you're exactly right. And Bruce Dern is dead on. I've often said that about Bruce Dern. Yeah. yeah me too. He knows what he's talking me about. Me too. On know? the money. <laughs> finger on the pulse. Bruce Dern, finger on the pulse. They always say that the trick to getting a contemporary podcast audience. <laughs> bring yeah. an acronistic. Let's talk about Laura Dern's dad. <laughs> not, Laura, not even Laura Dern, her dad. Yeah, that's right. Um, can I ask you a Broad City question? Of course. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about, uh, well, it relates to babes. You mentioned earlier that someone was asking you uh, about how the way you write about friendship with Broad City is, is different than the way you, you write about right. friendship now. But I'm sort of interested in you as an artist about why you why you write about friendship in, in the first place. And, I, and then before I came in, I read a quote with you. You said, um, I'll probably be telling these stories for the rest of my life. <laughs> stories about female friendship for the, for the rest of your life. Talk to me about that fulfillment that you get from telling stories about f- friendship. Where does it, what, what's going on? Again, like, I, I feel so privileged to have this space to reflect on this and I'm like still figuring out this answer as it was um, started to be asked recently it's interesting it's a theme that comes up themes yeah. that come up over and over again in someone's yeah. work are interesting yeah and it's it's um for me it's like uh, the thing I'm discovering as I keep thinking about this answer uh, this question and continually answering it in becoming the new person I am each day is that I I love love I love people. I'm so I'm I, I consider myself like a a doggy person. You know, some people are cat people and they're like they want more space. And I like being up in people and knowing what their deal is and how their day was. I really love people. And you know, I I'm a I'm a real friend and lover person. I like how how thick or thin that edge can be between the two, how one can hinge from one to the other and back. I um, really am interested also in how primary partnerships and romantic partnerships look like best friendships, you know, um, sort of shit talking with my husband. And and I'm like, ooh, shade. And he's like not trying to throw shade. He's like trying to really just, but he's just <laughs> so accurately naming somebody's deal and mm-hmm. like what's going on with them. You know, like I... And, and my friends, when I feel um, in love with them, when I feel like we're figuring out how to live uh, and it feels like partnership or, you know, I'm 37. I've been living in the city for almost 20 years and and in comedy for almost 
20 years and this um this idea keeps coming up there or this this feeling for me that I I'm just actually looking forward to growing old together which is a sentiment usually reserved for uh, a spouse or a primary partner and I feel that way about my friends and my collaborators I just said this to um Marcel Dejeuner, who does my hair, uh, who did my hair at my special. You know, like I, I, those lines that are blurred and are beautiful to me and interesting and also like thrilling because you're not supposed to blur them or walk that edge. But, but why? Like, is there, is, let me, let me, let me re- reflect on you a little bit. So, um, I, I feel like I take my friendships really, really seriously. Like the friendships I have, I, I think about my friends a lot. I care about my friends a lot. But I think sometimes that's because I didn't have a lot of friends. Like I didn't have a lot Growing of friends up. in high school and in, and in junior high. I didn't have a lot of buddies. And so the ones when I started to make – or I would ha- – ah, I would have to change who I was a little bit to make friends. When you were younger. Yeah. I would have to be a little – I would have to dampen certain parts of myself or I'd mm. have to pretend I liked things I didn't like or I would have to – I would have to – I don't know, say I liked an album that I didn't mm. like or I would have to smoke and I didn't want to smoke mm-hmm. or I'd have to lie to my parents and I didn't want to lie to parents. I'm just trying to find friends. And then when I found friends that I authentically yeah. related to, I treasured those relationships right. so much because I didn't even think they existed. Mm-hmm. Is there anything going on like that about the reason you, you write so much about friendships and you love friendships? I think that um, I, I think that my personality and my skill set and the gifts that I have in this life make um, representing friendship. I'm really good at that. What's really going on with me is deepening my friendships, my old, old friendships, but um, doing so much therapy that I'm really trying to figure out who I really am and, and being okay enough with myself to simply be with my friends, even my oldest friends, I perform or perform or um, try to give extra to ensure love, and I'm I'm really trying to feel like I am enough and just be with those friends, new friends, old friends. I mean, you know, in 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 um in all areas in my life, and I forget if we had this conversation in the first time interview or or when uh after the show but um my therapist like separated the idea of personal and impersonal for me in stand-up which i had thought of as very personal and press i had i had taken very personally where i'm like i'll just be my truest self and da 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 and um it's not like a separation and a compartmentalization so much so that it is like um like um when you're getting an eye exam and the yeah. lenses are changing, it's like yeah. just changing the lens a little bit. Being as true as I can in, I, 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 you know, as a spiritual practice, giving out as authentic energy as I can, but like con- context switching correctly and really being okay with who I am with my friends and just like not filling the space not, um, <laughs> you know, whether that be with words, whether that mm-hmm. be with extra action or whatever, just um, that's really what I'm going through. That I mean, the, 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 I asked that not to pry into your personal life, but because I saw that in the film, too. Mm. I saw the film about two people who are learning to love each other no matter what, who always said to each other as friends, we're going to love each other no matter what. Yeah. Well, what happens when no matter what comes mm-hmm. and what happens when right. you have to show your most right. awful self right. to one another? Can you still love one another? Right. Yeah. I dug, I dug that part of the film. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, um, last, <laughs> last time we were here, we spent a lot of time talking about what Broad City meant to you. Mm. And you spoke so beautifully about how it really changed my life, is what you said to me. Mm. I went to your show, um, and I had never seen you do a stand-up before. Yeah. Um, and before I interviewed you last time, I actually hadn't spent that much time at Broad City. So I had to do a lot. You know, I, I watched wow. a lot of it for the first time and, and really, you know, dug into it. I'm sorry. I, this is the wrong place to tell you that. I'm no, sorry, it's great. But it's just cracking me up when I, you know, to watch Broad City and then meet me, it, it must be. Be interesting. <laughs> I'm on the inside of it, so I'm just like that. Must be wild. It was. It was lovely. Yeah. Um, oh, I was talking to a couple of friends on the. Uh, <laughs> what do you want? Oh, she's wild. You know? uh, um, when I was talking to, well, my friend, my friend Shell there, and I was talking to Vanessa, our producer, um, uh, uh, out there, and I was talking, and, and I was talking to folks at your show. 
uh, who would come up and talk to me about that they heard our, they had heard our interview and, because they're and like, oh my god, Tom Power. They were like, uh, sir, where's my seat? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious because they knew you. They, yeah, oh, no, they they had heard our yeah they had cool. uh, they had heard our conversation. I'm cool. too Irish. I love it. I'm too Irish Catholic to say that it's because they recognize. Yeah, I understand, but, you know but I mean? great, like, yeah. love it. They had come up to me and said, oh hi, Tom. I uh, heard your chat with Alana, blah, 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 blah. And cool. We were just talking a little bit about it. I don't have, I don't have a question. I just wanted to tell you that. I just wanted yeah. to show oh, off. Oh, cool. I love it. Thank you. No, they uh, they had they, oh, they said to me okay. the same thing over and over You're again. Yeah, oh. I'm joking. Okay, yeah. I get it. Uh, not doing a great job. Uh, I'm loving it. Thank you. Um, they said the same thing to me, that it really changed my life. I don't hear people talk about comedy series that way very much. Mm. Mm. Here's the hard question. With a little bit of distance on the show now, why do you think it changed people's lives why do you think people are telling me it changed their life (laughs) oh my gosh i don't know like as um half of the vessel for it myself and abby jacobson and paul w downs and lucia on yellow were right up our butts in there in it with us every step of the way but you know as half of the vessel with abby it just feels like uh for me like a god-given journey that um when i when i got pregnant, I, um, I like knew that that was, that had worked (laughs) (laughs) and I like really took some space to open up to God and the universe and the higher power to marry the spiritual world and the physical world and whatever soul was meant to be, to come through this body and be, oh my gosh, I'm getting clapped, raised by me and my husband, like let, let it be. And that's, I think, before I entered this realm, you know, me and God were like, okay, let's do this. I, I think it's just like, I have no, I, I can't, there's no, I have no idea. It's you it's not for me to answer. You, you can't, you can't, I guess not, Harry. I mean. I just thought with a bit of, a bit of, a bit of, a bit of distance, you might be like, you know what? I think we did this. I think we did that. I think we I mean, did. like the components. I mean, it's so like babes, it's so real. It's so, and and people mistake that where they're like, "Is it improv?" And we were like, "What did you say?" Do you understand how hard we worked on yeah. every word in this show yeah. to make it perfect? Yeah, uh, like, but so that's not what I mean. But but um, you know, it was not no no um like man behind a camera saw me and spotted me. If you can believe it, I wasn't discovered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, from that, you know, um, functional perspective, it's it's like two auteurs who are like really offering our full every tool we got we're using. Um, I think at because it was on broadcast television and TV was um, our attention hadn't been split by yeah. one single algorithm monopolized by one individual, which is criminal and crazy and so dangerous. We there was still a, a cultural center of television, and our focus wasn't so split. Our brains weren't so scrambled. The time that it hit Wednesdays at ten thirty like sounds crazy to me right now. Wednesdays ten thirty. Like, I like I can't looking I, at my watch and going. I got to be back in front of the couch to watch. <laughs> tick tick tick. 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 Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. crazy. Yeah. You know, um, I think because we are queer, me and Abby, and Jewish and Jewy. And it's like kind of like it was kind of sneak attack. We didn't, you know, I, there were like articles about, about how Alana is bi. And I was like, Re- really? You know, but it's like I knew in my body that I'm attracted to different kinds of people along the gender spectrum. But I didn't I, I wasn't labeling it. And then Abby, you know, realizes her queerness and puts it into the show. And I, you know, and like you just don't see usually non-Jewish people. Women play Jewish women and Jewish guys write the thing and then they, you know, Mm -hmm. they get to play themselves. Like you don't see Jewish women being Jewy like Mm -hmm. we were. I Mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, these are components um, filmed in New York on location. We were so young. But like, I don't, I don't know. Why did it change people's lives? Like, that's just a feeling. I think you answered it right there. Okay, good. I think you answered it. I really think you answered it. But for me, it's like, it's just a, a feeling. I've got a couple more minutes. So uh, one more broad city question, and I'll bring it back to babes. But a, a, a broader bo- a broad city question, huh? Uh, and if you can't answer it, because if I'm putting you on the spot, that's okay. We can we can move on. Okay. But we were just we were talking about we, 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 we were looking for a cameo story, like a story about a cameo on the. 
Because Vanessa was talking to me about it, and she was, uh, she was, and I said, "Oh yeah, you know, I've watched a little bit of it now, and I really, I really like it, and I really love Alana, and this is great, you know." And she said, "Maybe you know, Shania Twain was on it, like Canadian icon Shania Twain oh, was on it. Oh my God, Shania uh, Twain. Hillary Clinton was on it. Blake Griffin was on it. Whoopi Goldberg was on it. RuPaul was RuPaul's on it. On, you got one? Um, do I have a Vanessa Williams? Oh my God, Vanessa Williams is so." powerful and sexy and beautiful. I kind of only have compliments. Whoopi couldn't believe she was showing up and doing a sister act cameo in Broad City. <laughs> and like we used to film in like a literal abandoned building. Ugh, please. RuPaul. Um, <laughs> to have Ru be such a like a bitch to me was so such a dream come true. And Shania was incredible. So gracious and so down it was crazy we had written about her for seasons and then asked if she would do it couldn't believe that she did that was wild and and our music shows up in the in in babes as well which is nice that's right me. that's I, I, right um let's 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 go back to your let's go back to babes at the end here so this film is a, is, a, is a lot about change and, and a lot of the conversation we've had so far today is about the change that you've had either um, externally through uh, having a kid internally through going to therapy and trying to realize your your balance between your personal and your private the version of you you do in front of a microphone versus the version you'll do when we turn off the microphones and we and, and you know, we talk to one another again. A lot of change in your life over the past decade or so. Um, what do you want this next chapter to look like for you? I really hope to keep doing what I'm doing. I want to keep making TV and film and doing stand-up in such a way that my humanity – and at this point, that really means my family is centered and organized around. And I want to, um, I want to play with different kinds of um, creatives. I want to play with different kinds of filmmakers and writers and performers um, because I think, uh, you know, I really love creating a whole world with my like comedy camp, you know, and and. Josh and Susie and I want to make more comedies and are working on more right now. Uh, and I also want to um, have that friend and lover feeling, you know, with with new and different um, creative partners in TV and film and stand up. It's a it's a really and I meant what I said to you. It's a really beautiful film. Thank you. And a really funny film, but a really, really beautiful film. Thank you so much. Th thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. What a pleasure. Mm -hmm.